Hi everybody, um, my name is Sabine Spare and I am founder and designer of Toronto-based brand Spare Label. Okay, so um, today I'm going to talk about the democratization of design through making and how my line, my teaching practice, and my collaborations all inform each other. Um, this is an image of my West End Toronto studio. So this is what small production looks like. <laughs> this one sewing machine, one cutting table. Um, so I do fabric marbling. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, fabric marbling is an aqueous surface design technique. It originated in Turkey, and um, in Turkish it's called Ebru. So uh, the process involves dropping pigments onto a liquid surface, and because of um, physics and fluid dynamics, the pigments um, expand and contract and meld into each other, creating very intricate organic patterns. And um, once the pattern is made, a print is taken of the design using a pre-treated natural fiber fabric, um, for example, cotton or silk. Um, this is a picture of what I affectionately refer to as the big vat, and this is as big as I can marble. It's the size of my wingspan, and when I do it, I have someone help me out in the studio because the fabric needs to be placed on the surface completely flat. Um, sometimes when I'm in the studio, I get to pretend to be a scientist, um, mixing up various powders and liquids, and everything can be very um, measurement heavy and mathematical. Um, but I'm also very cognizant about the impact of all of the chemicals and dyes that I'm using. I use only water-soluble dyes and inks, and um, the size, which is the liquid that's in the vat, is biodegradable. And I'm also very aware of water use. Uh, water use is a huge issue in the textile industry, and so I'm always trying to uh, recycle water when possible and use as little water as possible. Um, so the fabrics that I use are all dead stock. Um, dead stock means it's new, but was over ordered from a fashion house or is from a fashion house that has gone out of business. So the advantage of dead stock is that it is using what already exists as opposed to um, creating a demand for more. And I think this is um, a really good solution. So. Um, a limitation of it, though, is that everything in my collections is limited edition because once the fabric runs out, I actually cannot order more. <laughs> um, so with marbling, each print is a monotype, which means that um, no two designs will ever be the same. And this is an image of the pieces of fabric that were printed in the big vat drying. And, um, Sometimes I'll really love a specific print, but I can never recreate it. And for me, that's a really um, important part of my design process is just accepting that um, one piece will only ever exist and it can never be the same. <laughs> and I've been approached by people asking if I'm going to do digital prints or companies that do digital printing saying, hey, work with us. But um, I don't think that it aligns with my philosophy, or at least I haven't figured out at this point how to make that align, but I, at this point I really love the fact that each print is a monotype. And again, I cut, sew, and iron each piece myself using my vintage industrial Mitsubishi, um, this guy here. Um, and in the future, I do hope as Spare Label grows, I hope to be able to outsource sewing to contractors within Toronto, but made local, made in Toronto is very important to me. I think that um, a huge advantage of it is you can physically see the um, working conditions that the people who are creating your pieces are working in. You can have that human connection 
And um, for example, I was, t I was getting buttonholes done recently and the contractor that I go to, her studio's in Kensington Market, um, we were chatting, she was talking to me about her, um, what foods she eats on a daily basis, she showed me how she can do the split, so it was really like a funny little interaction, and I think that this human connection is, um, it's super important to me, and I think that um, David's talk did a really good um, job of laying the foundation, so I'm not going to tell you guys about all those problems, because you already know. <laughs> um, so one of the things I really love about Spare Label is getting to collaborate with other emerging creatives. Um, this is a photo from my most recent photo shoot. Uh, I w got to work with photographer Polina Teef, and um, when I have a good team, it's really, oh, there we go. <laughs> Um, I love working with a, with a really great team because you can just have um, bouncing ideas off each other and it's so energizing and you can really create something that you feel just so good about. Um, so this is one of the, oops, yeah, one of the um, images from the collection. The collection is titled Apophenia. Apophenia refers to the human tendency to perceive connection or meaningful pattern between seemingly unrelated or random things. Um, the conceptually driven collection of luxury loungewear explores the visceral experience of being dressed. And as I mentioned, each piece is cut from a monotype piece of fabric. So um, yeah, each one is a unique item. Um, so obviously, I love to make things, and the things I make, I don't want to be sitting in my studio or collecting dust or unseen. I want people to own these pieces. I want them to be worn. I want them to be used. I want them to be enjoyed and make people happy. Um, but that being said, I have a lot of issues with our current system of consumption and with the fashion industry in general. <laughs> there we go. Um, <laughs> so we obviously all need stuff, uh, but the question is what kind of stuff and how much of it. This is an image from the TV show Hoarders, as I'm sure you guys are familiar with. And I think that past generations viewed owning objects as a signifier of affluence and um, being able to buy things showed oh, I have money to buy things, so I'm going to do that. But today, a lot of people are realizing that um, cheap stuff is not making them happy, and actually, it's quite the opposite. Um, I, I meet a lot of people and um, uh, talk to a lot of people who are choosing to live a more curated lifestyle than the one they were brought up with. And I think a lot of people are choosing to buy less items and be more selective about the items that they do buy. Um, but that being said, it can sometimes be very difficult to navigate how to make sustainable and ethical purchasing decisions. Um, it can be really hard to know which companies to trust and um, which companies are sustainable and ethical and in which ways because these umbrella terms can mean a lot of different things and be interpreted in a lot of different ways. And just because one brand is sustainable and ethical in one way doesn't mean that they are in other ways. So an example of this being uh, the debate of leather versus pleather. Leather obviously having a lot of um, animal rights issues and being pretty devastating from that perspective, but then pleather having a lot more environmental issues, not being biodegradable, and the way that it's made is really devastating. So um, there kind of aren't easy answers to these questions, and it can sometimes just come down to um, choosing something that you care about and deciding to focus on that one thing, because I recognize it is difficult to care about everything and do everything right. <laughs> And also, ethical and sustainable products can be cost... Thank you. <laughs> it's hard to do both. <laughs> um, ethical and sustainable products can be cost prohibitive for a lot of people. 
Um, expensive items are not always ethical and sustainable. David touched on this. Uh, go to any high-end store selling designer brands and a lot of the time those brands are made in the exact same factories that mall brands are made and they just have a higher price point because they have that brand name. Um, but ethical, sustainable brands usually are more expensive and there's sort of no way to avoid this. Um, so a lot of people might feel like they don't have any options and um, this is the opposite of democracy, feeling as though you want to do a good thing but you really are forced not to be able to. <laughs> so um, one answer that I'm seeing people come to is sharing and trading rather than buying. Um, so in Toronto there are a lot of great things happening with the sharing economy and with trading, um, things like Bun's trading zone is super mm -hmm. huge right now. Um, and what I think is really great about these, uh, these platforms is not only are they offering a positive alternative to consumption, but also they're creating community. And um, creating a community around sharing and trading is, I think it's really an awesome answer because consuming can be very isolating whereas sharing can really bring us together. Um, <laughs> so a problem with the world we live in a lot of the, for a lot of people is an increased sense of isolation. I know most people I talk to feel as though they spend too much time staring at a screen and not enough time out in the world, experiencing things in real life, meeting people in real life. And um, yes, our lives are very mitigated by technology, but how do we also have a sense of community that is just, um, it, it's super important to us as humans. So, So this brings me back to the topic, the democratization of design through making. And um, I'm going to talk about making within the setting of a workshop. Um, workshops uh, facilitate the act of making because they intentionally set aside time to do this. And a lot of us live very busy lives. We don't necessarily have time to make things in our spare time or after work. There can be so many other priorities that we can focus on. But if we do something like take a workshop, then um, we're really setting this chunk of time aside to do that. Um, so I teach a variety of textile and garment construction techniques at my studio and also through the design exchange and other community oriented spaces. Mm -hmm. um, the main technique that I teach is fabric marbling. And I think that it's really a lot of fun to teach this because um, everyone, regardless of skill level or if they come at it from um, being working in a creative creative industry or not working in a creative industry anyone can make something that looks good and has a fun and instantly gratifying experience um, so here's a picture of me and my studio doing a demonstration on clearing the vat um, clearing the vat is the first step in making a marbled print And um, in my workshops, participants get to experiment with different colors and tools and techniques. And sometimes people ask me if, since my designs are pretty much all achromatic, if they're going to get to actually use color in the workshops. <laughs> um, so yes, obviously I, I want people to be able to express themselves creatively and whether that means using a full rainbow design or just making something in black and white. Um, either way, I think that's pretty great. Okay. Um, so part of the process of marbling involves working together. You actually need four hands to place the fabric down flat on the liquid surface. 
and um, it's really fun to see how people become friends through this process and um, part of the workshops that I love is seeing how people get to make friends um, that are outside of their uh, maybe age demographic or ha of different backgrounds or um, just meet people that they wouldn't normally meet and work together with them creating something that is just it's a lot of fun and um, yeah people often tell me how how rare it is to get to meet people outside of their social circles I think again this goes back to the idea of isolation that um, maybe a lot of us feel like we live in a bit of a bubble and we're just not really meeting people who have different perspectives. Um, so another really great byproduct of making things is an increased appreciation for how things are made. Um, it's really easy to not think about the time and effort um, that went into creating something, but every object in our life was created either by a machine or by a human or a combination of both, but um, without knowing how those processes are done, we generally just overlook it. Um, but when you take the time to learn how to do a skill such as sewing or printing or woodworking or ceramics um, and actually physically use your hands to create an object, you gain a newfound appreciation for the person that created that object for you. And I find that when people have this newfound reverence for how things are made, they often are a lot more motivated to take care of the objects in their life. And rather than throwing something out if it gets a little rip in it, they're more likely to take the time to sew a patch on their jeans. Um, or they're more likely to take their shoes to the shoe repair person as opposed to throw them in the garbage. And I think, again, this is a really um, important step in democratizing design. Um, and another important element of the workshops is uh, the idea of play. A lot of people tell me how fun it was to get the opportunity to play. Um, and I think that's a thing that most of us don't give ourselves time to do. Uh, we live very busy lives and things need to be scheduled. Things need to have a practical purpose and a, um, a visible outcome, a visible result. So to just um, have fun, just do something that is completely w impractical and without purpose can be very freeing. Um, so another thing with the workshops is I really love to see what people come up with and see how their individual styles come through in the designs they make. Um, a lot of the time I can see uh, people having continuity in their color schemes or their patterning techniques and um, yeah, I love seeing how everyone puts their own spin on, on this technique even if it's something that they just learned. And this can also become a symbiotic relationship between myself, the designer or um, facilitator of the class, and then also the students, because in a lot of ways I'm showing them something that is inspiring them, but then they're creating something that is inspiring me back. And I can learn from them and they can learn from me, and it's a really nice um, give and take relationship. So I think that um, feeling as though you've accomplished something, making an object from beginning to end is so, so valuable. And many of us have jobs where we're just uh, doing one part of a process or we're assisting in one way in, a, in something happening. But I think it's pretty rare to be able to um, make something from start to finish. And that might, s five minutes? Sure. Um, I think that process is very satisfying. And um, some people have asked me if through teaching the workshops, I'm scared that people are going to copy my designs, <laughs> which I think is kind of a, a funny thing because if someone were to take the time and effort to um, 
to marble their to marble fabric and make clothes out of it, I would actually think that was really great. I I, I would not feel um, upset or threatened or anything. I I think that it's such an enjoyable process, but at the same time a labor-intensive process and a time-consuming process that um, if someone were to copy me, I'd say, good on them, keep at it. <laughs> um, so today, with an increasing number of people wanting to support sustainable and ethical brands, I think people are increasingly interested in the story behind brands and they want to know how something was made. Um, so social media, I'm specifically thinking of Instagram, is like a really amazing tool for being able to see the behind the scenes view. Um, and I think that this is actually really contributing to making slow fashion cool because people are, are, are interested in how the yarn was sourced, who the dyers were, who, the, um, who was cutting it, the people behind it. And there are a lot of really great um, companies doing this sort of thing through social media, sh telling the full story of their products. And the brands who aren't scared to tell the story are the ones that are are making sustainable ethical products. The brands that are just showing you the finished product, you have to ask yourself, what, what do they have to hide? Why are they not showing how it was made? Why are they not showing the people who are making it? Um, so another thing I love to do with my line is custom development. and. Um, People come to my studio and we'll talk through an idea together. So oftentimes they'll see a piece in my collection that will spark their interest, but they'll have their own vision in mind for how they want that item to work in their life and how they want it to be specifically suited to them. So we'll kind of just talk through this idea and um, work together on developing it. And this process is very collaborative, and I really love um, hearing people's feedback, hearing what they want to make, what specifications they need to feel as though an object is going to work really well for them, for their wants and their needs. And I think that this collaborative design process makes owning things a lot more enjoyable. Um, when com someone comes to your house and asks you, hey, I really like your pillows, where did you get them? If you're able to say, oh, actually, it's a really interesting story. I met the designer at their studio and got to see their blah, 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 blah. It just makes that experience so much more interesting than saying, oh, yeah, I bought them at the store and thousands of other people have the exact same pillows. Um, so I, I think people are increasingly interested in having objects in their life that are a conversation point that they feel proud to discuss and tell people about. Um, and I think that objects are something that can easily be overlooked. We can um, be using a pencil case every day and not think about that pencil case. Or we can be using a pencil case every day and every single time we see it for a fraction of a second, it makes us happy a little bit. And um, it's kind of a simple little thing, but I think surrounding yourself by objects that make you a tiny bit happy as opposed to a tiny bit annoyed um, can have ultimately a really big effect on your life. Um, yeah, because we all see these things and we all know that feeling when you um, are using this one your phone case, for example, and every single time you see that it's broken and it was badly made and it annoys you a little bit, but you just don't get a new one for whatever reason, but it's just like having objects that um, feel good and right and like they work with your lifestyle, it's just such a better feeling. Um, so on top of collaborations with clients, I also really enjoy doing um, artistic collaborations. Um, my most recent one is the Aqueous Project, and it's a collaboration with uh, robotic architect Joey Jacobson. 
The Aqueous Project is a series of experimental methods that automate the art of fabric marbling without losing the authenticity of the craft. So, ah, uh, oh no, <laughs> that's that one. Without losing the authenticity of the craft. So basically we're working on building a marbling robot um, <laughs> and part of the um, nature of marbling, uh, because it's all based on fluid dynamics and physics, each print is still going to be a monotype. So um, that's a project that I'm really excited about. And um, we're currently in the process of securing funding for the Aquion 2, which is the second in the series of marbling robots. <laughs> And I'm also um, really excited to be a part of this project called Toronto Makes, and it's a book put on by Family of Things, and they're aiming to tell the story of over 50 Toronto makers, um, and just showing, profiling these different makers, talking about their process, their studio, um, all of this stuff, and it's all focused on Toronto makers. So they uh, currently have a Kickstarter in the works, and... Um, my piece, of, my marbled scarves, which you can see here, and also the workshops are part of the incentives. They have a lot of really amazing incentives from all the different makers involved in the project, if you want to check that out. And so, um, the democratization of design through making is a philosophy that says that we can all be designers and makers and surround ourselves by things that tell a story. We can surround ourselves by things we're proud of owning and we can get excited to tell people about them. I believe that the democratization of design through learning, sharing, collaborating and making truly is the future. So shameless self-promotion now. Um, if anyone wants to take one of my workshops, I'm doing two in December, and I'm going to be doing them at the um, project space in Lululemon, which is Queen and Spadina. Um, yeah, so if you're interested, check it out. And thank you all for listening to my talk. <laughs>